together tonight at the doctrine of the church. I put there in parentheses on your notes, ecclesiology, the fancy way to say doctrine of the church is ecclesiology. It comes from the Greek word ekklesia, uh, which is the Greek word for that we translate church. A, uh, ekklesia really uh, means uh, the ones who've been called out or the one who, ones who have been called to assemble. And uh, we're going to look at the doctrine of the church tonight and next Wednesday night. It began to be clear to me as I studied that I was not going to be able to cover, cover all the important ground uh, in the doctrine of the church uh, in one session, or at least I couldn't do it without going really fast and probably going over time, which y'all know I never do. <laughs> So we'll look uh, and we'll, make a, a, uh, we'll look at what the Bible has to say about the doctrine of the church and also what, uh, uh, what church history has had to say about the doctrine of the church. We won't get all the way through that, but we'll, we'll make uh, some good headway. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm trying to remind you week by week that this is a, a, a course called Systematic Theology, and Systematic Theology is a... Uh, is a uh, a discrete area of study in, in Christian studies, uh, focusing on how to go all the way through uh, the scriptures uh, and place uh, different truths that we find in the scriptures into relevant categories so we can sort of look at, uh, at um, uh, theological ideas in scripture t together at the same time. And so uh, what we have here for the study of the doctrine of the church is we is, is um, the way the doctrine of the church is developed is to go through the Old and the New Testament, find all the scriptures that speak uh, of church or of the people of God or how God uh, calls and uses a people, pile all those scripture verses together, look at the way the church has looked at them through the centuries, uh, and craft together a statement of the doctrine of the church. But for all of our doctrines, a good systematic theology also has a central idea. So let me remind you again, our theological declaration, the thing that we believe is fundamental, if you're going to say uh, you have Christian beliefs, this is, this is essentially what Christians everywhere must believe in order to be Christians. Our declaration is this, the God of the Bible, remember where does the uh, primary data for Christian theology come from? It comes from the Bible, all right? We don't hide that fact. We're not ashamed or embarrassed or, or we'll, we'll let people know that later. We lead with the Bible uh, as, as this uh, miracle, uh, the, a perfect treasure of divine instruction is what the Baptist faith and message says. And that's a, a good description. And so the God of the Bible is the God that we're talking about. But this God of the Bible is also the greatest uh, of all beings. There's no one higher than him. He is ultimate. And as value-seeking creatures, we are, we are constantly in search of what has the greatest value. And eventually, you have to arrive at that, at that essential question of all things, what is the highest value? And it turns out that the God of the Bible uh, is also the thing and the being of the, of the highest ultimate value. He reveals himself. If he doesn't make himself known to us, we don't know anything about him. And then the, the part of this theological declaration that's relevant to the doctrine of the church uh, as we look at it tonight, is this. This God of the Bible is redeeming His creation, especially His image bearers. So what God is doing in His work of redemption uh, is He is redeeming people. Uh, and we've declared that uh, uh, human beings are image bearers. We have a job, and our job is to reflect the glory of creation to the God who's worthy of it uh, and to reflect the glory of God into creation. Uh, as sort of an angled mirror is that image that I get from, from N.T. Wright. That's what image bearers are to do. We're to be the, the ones through whom God's rule and God's glory and blessing comes to the whole earth. We ruined that in Adam and Eve. Uh, and then human beings are in rebellion against that call to be image bearers and that sin. But when God rescues human beings, image bearers, and starts to restore uh, us as image bearers, He also uh, calls us together uh, into a people. And so it's plural there, especially His image bearers. 
uh, what God is doing, uh, He is doing uh, to call together a people through whom His kingdom authority and His kingdom purposes are unleashed into the whole uh, world. Uh, and so He's doing this through His Son, Jesus Christ, by His Holy Spirit. And so here's the main idea of ecclesiology, or the main idea uh, that we're asserting in the doctrine of the church, is that the church is a community of redeemed image bearers in whom and through whom God's ultimately re ultimate redeeming work goes out to all creation. And here's the paradigm shift I've been hammering away at week by week. And here's how it applies to the church. We are not little saved people who pile up in one place and sort of safely have ourselves tucked away behind the walls of the church waiting for our trip to heaven. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the church. That, and that tendency to think that, that what salvation is, 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 is it punches my ticket to heaven so that I know what happens to me after I die. And then what I do between now and the day I die physically is I, I sort of just kind of do what I want to do. Uh, and then I've got the worry and the concern about what happens after I die that that's handled. That is not a biblical picture of, of our God and what God is up to. And so the correct view of the church uh, is that, is that um, heaven is coming down. The kingdom of God, God's ruling from, from, from His place uh, uh, in, in the heavenly places. God's desire is for that rule to come down. Uh, and it's come down through Christ. And it's been unleashed through the Spirit of Christ. And it's come down into His image bearers. And it creates a church. And so the church is to be this outpost of the kingdom. It's supposed to be this instantiation and manifestation of God's ultimate purposes for His creation. It should be a little picture of heaven now. A little picture of redemption and glory and power and purpose and meaning and joy now. And people ought to be able to find out that Jesus is Lord by watching us. The church is how the world finds out that Jesus is Lord. The church is how the world finds out that Jesus is Lord. And so the question for our church is, when people come in and around us, come in and around individual members, when people watch us come in out of this building, or maybe people came into this building, would they... Would they be finding out in everything we say and do and the way we treat one another and the, and the things we engage in, would that just be announcing the Lordship of Christ oh, and, and putting the Lordship of Christ on display? That's the job of the church. Not hiding out in a holy huddle until we take our trip to heaven, but an outpost of the kingdom of God, a broadcast uh, and a picture of of God's redemptive purposes for, for all things. So, what does the... Oh, and let me stop there. Any questions about any of that so far? Y'all with me? Okay. What does the Bible say then about the church? And I really want, want you to know that um, I am hewing very closely to your theology textbook. Uh, theology for the Church uh, is your textbook by Danny Aiken. And what's unique about that text is each... Doctrine is written by a different author, and the author of the Doctrine of the Church is Mark Dever, uh, and uh, Dever is a is uh, a denominational um, leader when it comes to what is the church. He has an organization called Nine Marks, which is the Nine Marks of the Church. What what should characterize all churches? And so he's done a great deal of thinking. Mark and I served on a committee together uh, um, for the for the convention. Uh, and I know him and appreciate a great deal of what he does. And, and his chapter is really long. And it is packed with information. And it's one you ought to familiarize yourself with. And I just thought it was so good that I'm really kind of following him closely. Not only because it's good stuff, but also to point you back to your chapter in your textbook in case you ever want to go back and look at anything or get, get more info about it. All right? So... What does the Bible say? One of the, th one of the things that the Bible will say about the church is, first of all, the nature of the church. What is the, what is the meaning and essence uh, and fundamental idea of, of the church? In the Old Testament, uh, there is this idea of being called out. Kahal 
is the Hebrew word for congregation. It's the Hebrew word uh, for, for the, the gathering of God's people. And uh, it's a word that means to assemble or the, the assembly. And it's rooted in, uh, in the idea of those who are called together. So it's not just a group of people who happen to show up at the same place at the same time. But it's a group of people who um, have been called by an authority and are given their identity by that call. All right? So here's how this fleshes itself out. First of all, uh, uh, the nature of the church is an image-bearing in community. When God made the decision to make human beings in His image, how did He make human beings in His image? He made them what? Male and female. All right? At the very fundamental level of what it means to be an image bearer, we bear image in community. Uh, a, a man and a woman together bear the image of God. And then from that idea, they were going to be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. And so it is a family, it is a people. That's how we put the image of God on display. God creates people in, in, in community and then He calls the people. Even though human beings rejected uh, God's call to be image bearers, uh, He redeems them uh, and continues to, to desire to have uh, this people who put His rule on display. So uh, Genesis 1, God makes a people. Genesis 12, God calls a people. Remember, if you ever get lost when you're reading the Bible, especially Old Testament, and you need a, you need a North Star to get back to what's going on, you can get the what's going on question answered every time in Genesis 1 through 3. And anybody remember what's going on? I'm sorry, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. What's going on in Genesis 12, 1 through 3? It's, it's uh, Abraham is the, is the center of attention. What's going on there? God's going to channel his uh, blessing through Abraham. All right. To be That's right. Through you and through this great big family I'm going to create through you, all the families of the earth are going to find their blessing in this. All right? That's the... The, a, a people who are being called into existence. And so uh, we're image bearing in community. And so in Exodus chapter 6, again, after things have gone wrong and, and there's uh, sin and brokenness and God's people are in slavery, uh, then God sends Moses uh, and Moses uh, um, uh, calls the people out of slavery. And in Exodus 6, Moses is there in Egypt and he's, he's laying out this mission before the people and they're struggling on whether or not they're going to follow Moses. Uh, and then uh, God reminds Moses to tell them, tell them, um, I'm going to be their God and they're going to be my people. I'm going to be their God and they're going to be my people. You can really boil down the story of, of, of the Old Testament to, the, to, to God's pursuit of that ideal. I'm going to be your God. And does God ever um, let his side of that covenant down? I'm going to be your God? Mm-mm. But it's, it's the battle of, of uh, having them be uh, his people. And so uh, then you've got this question uh, uh, as we look at what the Bible has to say about how Israel in the Old Testament relates to the church in the New Testament. Uh, there is a deep relationship between the two, uh, but yet there's a distinction between Israel and the church as well. Uh, Many of you may be familiar with dispensational theology, all right? And dispensational theology uh, really views a very, very, very stark distinction between Israel and the church. Uh, I don't espouse, I'm not a dispensationalist, and so I, um, the, the most hard-edged dispensationalism is uh, that God has a special role for Israel uh, and they can even continue to be covenant people without trusting Christ, all right? Wrong, okay? Uh, every Jew who is going to be saved is going to be saved because, because he or she puts their faith in, in Christ alone, okay? Uh, so there aren't two plans, an Israel plan and a church plan. There's only one plan. It's the Jesus plan, okay? But you, I also don't believe in what's called replacement theology, which is uh, everything that God w intended to do through Israel, that is all now uh, b being done through the church. And Israel essentially serves no ongoing pur purpose, redemptive purpose. 
Okay? And so I think there's a, there's a bit of a tension as you look in the scripture about how Israel and the church relate to one another. But I would say very, very, very closely related. Uh, and it is okay uh, f- uh, to think in a sense that the, that, the, that the church in the New Testament is the new Israel. And I think it's, I think it's here's how I put it. Everything true of Israel is true of Christ. And everything true of Christ is true of his church. And so that's how you get there. You get there through Jesus. Okay? Um, so uh, the, the promises of God through Israel are fulfilled, but Israel has not been replaced. Uh, the, there's a close relationship between Israel, so close that Paul, the Apostle Paul can say in Galatians, he calls the church the Israel of God. He, he has no problem uh, talking in that kind of language. Um, and so Jesus is the link between the two. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the hopes and destiny of Israel. Uh, he's also the one who succeeds where Israel has failed. And so he's the summing up of, of all that Israel is about. And so everybody who trusts Christ and is in Christ, they're in Torah. Uh, they're in the I- identity of the people of God uh, um, uh, in that moment. Yet, I'll just say, and this is a little bit of a discursion, of a, of, a, of a rabbit path. What keeps me attentive to um, an ongoing ultimate purpose that's uniquely related to Israel is God's ongoing relationship with Israel. I just, I just think you have to pay attention to the fact that, that a nation goes out of existence and then comes back into existence 2,000 years later. It, 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 and, and God seemed to be indicating that's what we, <laughs> we should be expecting, that Israel is continuing to play an ongoing role. And for me, ultimately, ooh, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you want to know more, you can see me later and I can bore the socks off of you with this. But another main point for me is Romans chapter 9, where Paul makes the case that the, that the current and ongoing hardness or resistance of Israel to the gospel plays this unique role in making the gospel uniquely available to the Gentiles. And there's a, there's a, there's a role that, that Israel is playing in that, looking forward to a moment somewhere out in the future where, there, where this a, a great incoming of Jewish belief will, will be in keeping with the great incoming of Gentile belief that has characterized what's been going on over the last 2,000 years. All right, have I totally left everybody behind? Okay, um, so. You, you know, that, that's a good question, and here's, here's the other th- the thing I'm going to promise you. I'm going to do two weeks on eschatology as well, when we get to the end times and premillennialism and pre-trib, pre-mill, premillennialism, and it depends on what end time schema you're, you pick. And so you can do pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You can do none of that and have an, uh, what's called amillennialism, but I'm getting into my eschatology stuff now. But my, my short answer is, my belief is that Israel is playing some role in God's ultimate purposes for bringing all things to a conclusion. And I'll flesh more of that out when we get to the es- eschatology part. But I think Israel, qua Israel. Yes, sir? There you go. And, and I, yes, I, I, and a good way to always look at what Paul is up to, especially when Paul talks about Jews and the salvation of Jews, is very autobiographical. Uh, it's, it, even in Romans chapter 9 where he is speaking about this terrible resistance of the Jews to the gospel. Because that's the big question of the whole letter to Romans is why are all the Gentiles coming in and then none of the Jews are getting saved? And part of Paul's answer is, I was like that. I was killing Christians. I hated Christianity and I hated the church and I thought I was right. And then something stunningly supernatural happened to me that was within the purposes of God. Because remember now, 
What did Paul's persecution of the church do to the church? Made it grow. Made it grow. All right? And that's kind of Paul's point in Romans chapter 9. There is an ongoing role for Israel's resistance that plays this role in pushing the gospel to the whole world. And God, isn't God amazing that he can take our mess and actually recycle it into, into greater glory and, and greater gospel advance? So, uh, um, the, the distinctions then in the Old Testament, the ethnic distinction in the Old Testament, the people of God are ethnically um, uh, distinct. Uh, they're all genetically related to Abraham in the New Testament. They're ethnically, what, what's the ethnic makeup in the New Testament? Ethnically distinct, one, one ethnicity in the New Testament church? This is important. It, it's a, it, it is precisely a Jew-Gentile multi-ethnic church. And, and please get this. This is, this is often missed. We're, we, we, we're glad for justification to mean my relationship with the Lord, but we're less interested sometimes in justification. Also for Paul means my being right related with all other believers, all other people. Okay? And so... When the church in Galatia is making the decision just to worship separately on an ethnic basis because it's easier. Do, huh, do you think that people still worship separately ethnically because it's easier? <laughs> yeah, they do. And they do, so for, they do so for all the reasons that seem right to us. Okay? But when they tell Paul, we, we, we come up with a solution rather than irritating each other because we're different culturally and we got a little bit different angle. Why don't we just separate out? Remember what Paul's response to that is in Galatians? It's another gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't do that. The gospel of Je what does the gospel of Jesus Christ do to people who are very different from each other? He puts them together. And that shows the world the supernatural redemptive power of Christ alone. All right? So... Um, in terms of government in the Old Testament, the, the, the people of God, are, 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 they rule themselves. They have their own nation. Uh, in the New Testament, they're ruled by, they're, they're, they're not in charge of the government. Uh, the covenant sign in the Old Testament is circumcision. The covenant sign in the New Testament is baptism. Uh, and um, all the way to the very end in the book of Revelation, there is still this distinction between the 144,000 and then this great multitude. So in the purposes of God, there is a, a unity and distinction where Israel is still playing kind of a unique um, a redemptive role. All right? So um, that's, that's, that's the people of God in the Old Testament. People of God in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kahal. In the New Testament, the Hebrew word is ekklesia. It's used 144 times in the New Testament. The New Testament intends to communicate that it was God's intent at the center to have a church. All right? To have a, a church. Ecclesia means basically the same thing that kahal means. In fact, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, ecclesia is the word they chose to translate kahal when it appeared in the Old Testament. All right? So it means those who are called out as God's people, those who are assembled by God's call. Yes? So, so when Jesus first used the word ecclesia, his disciples are hearing assembly from the Old Testament, or is there already like a cultural context that they're understanding? Like what, so what did they hear when, when he first said Church. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and the question is, what when Jesus said, uh, uh, on this rock I'll build my church. All right? So that's really it, uh, uh, the first time the word church makes its appearance, and it makes its appearance on the lips of Jesus. All right? Because um, all Jews of Jesus' day spoke Greek, and all Jews of Jesus' day would have been familiar with the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In fact, it's likely that way more Jews read the Bible in Greek than they did in Hebrew. And so I believe when they heard ecclesia, uh, they thought of, of God's people in the Old Testament. Now established and fulfilled 
in, um, in Jesus. And I, and I would match it with this. It certainly uh, is indubitable that Jesus' ministry and his life is explicitly summing up the Old Testament and explicitly summing up the vocation of Israel, explicitly summing up the temple. So I think even in this calling of the church, it's saying everything you would have anticipated and are hoping for in the redeemed Israel, uh, those things can be expected in the ecclesia of Jesus as the, the fulfillment of, of Israel's hope. So Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm answering your right question, Jesus wasn't really announcing a new thing. Hey, I've got this idea. It's called a church. Uh, he was fulfilling an Old Testament hope. Now, I will also say that the synagogue, which is a post-Old Testament development, uh, would have been on Jesus' mind as well. That the, uh, there, Jesus never would have had in mind one site for one, like a, like a St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's like the main church that, that you go to. The, the vision would have been synagogues, messianic synagogues prolifer proliferating all over, well, well everywhere, everywhere uh, the gospel needs to be heard. Okay? So, um, so the Messiah calls and names his church in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Uh, and then another thing, y'all have heard me teach this before, but I think it's so clear as well. So Luke, the right author of the Gospel of Luke, is also the author of Acts, and it was one continuous story so that, Acts can, uh, so that Luke can make this point. We see the body of Christ in, in his Gospel so that we can be the body of Christ in Acts. Um, the, the, the deep connection uh, between Christ and his church, that the, the intent... For Jesus all along was to redeem a people who would represent him and live out his life and ministry in, um, in the world. So much so that you can take kind of the plot line of Jesus' life and you can match it up with the plot line and vocabulary of Stephen. It's the same verbiage that's used. Uh, and the plot line of, of, of Paul's life and the plot line of, of Peter's life. And then the experience of the church. Luke's intent is to, is to lay the church on top of, of, the, of the narrative of Jesus himself. That's how closely allied those two realities are. Uh, and then in Paul, um, Paul's statement, uh, kind of jumping off of what Dr. Henry said, um, he's a persecutor of the church who becomes a planter uh, of churches. So, Churches are at the center of what Paul is up to. I guess what I'm trying to hammer home is in our radical individualism in the West and in America, there's this idea that it's the individual first and then the church. And so there are these notions like, I, I can worship God up in my deer stand just as good as I can down at the church. Wrong. That's wrong. And Paul wouldn't have any... Uh, it would have made no sense that you would be a Christian and not uh, in the body of Christ. Like that's not, that's not a thing. But our individualism has created the ability for us to do that. But the church is at the beating heart of what Paul is, is up to. Always remember, all of his letters are written to who? They're written to churches that are written to pastors of churches. This is about what's going on in the church. Now, and, and real quick, what were the churches like, the, the local congregations like that Paul is writing to? These incredible, incredible epistles. What are, what are the churches like that he's writing to? Okay, troubled, one. How big were they? 15, 20, 30 people in a, in a house church. And maybe 15 or 20 of those little congregations sprinkled throughout a city like Rome or Ephesus. Probably a lot of lack of education. But yeah, now, yeah, exactly. How old were these churches? Uh, in, in the Thessalonians, they were six months old, six weeks old. Okay? Brand new. These were brand new baby Christians. 
or all the way up to grown up Christians, 15 years old, you know. But Paul is writing to them fully expecting for the manifold wisdom of God. That's what he says to the, to the Ephesians as a place where the manifold wisdom of God is going to be display, uh, on display. Get ready. He had utter confidence that the church was Jesus' plan for the world. And he couldn't be happier about what God was doing in them and he, and he, and he had a huge expectation. Uh, in Hebrews... I believe the letter to the Hebrews, the whole thing is written to culminate essentially or to climax in Romans 10, uh, uh, sorry, Hebrews 10, verse 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together is the habit of some. I think the problem that, that the writer of Hebrews is seeking to solve is because it's gotten hard to follow Jesus, we're just going to, we're just going to uh, take a vacation from church. And... The writer of Hebrews' point is, if you think that, you do not understand Jesus. You do not understand the gospel. You've missed the whole point. And, and, and the whole letter is wrapped. Jesus is so, so much better than anything else. And he has called us together. Why would you not want to be together? Jesus loves the church. And you should too. All right? Uh, and then in Revelation, um, uh, th this is a vision for the churches. And it's a vision for the future of the church. How does the book of Revelation begin? <clears throat> Letters to who? The seven churches. All right? And then it, 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 the, 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 um, the climax of that is a marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, uh, the, uh, the bride and the bridegroom coming together uh, and, uh, and, and leading forth the glory uh, of God over, uh, over uh, all creation and, and His redemption of all creation. And then this idea that the followers of Jesus are the followers of a slain lamb. That the triumphant people of God follow this ru ruler who is also a little lamb with his throat slit. I just think that's, a, that's an incredible image. We, we, uh, they, we overcame them by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, right? So anyway, they're a people created uh, by the gospel. <clears throat> and all of this, there, there are uh, just these themes uh, to catch on to, and then we'll, we'll I'll try to keep us moving. So the people of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, that's... that's mainly Pauline imagery, but I think that's a great picture of the Trinitarian God who is eternally in community with Himself and then He shares His, 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 uh, he shares his inner relational life with that which He has created and the main place where that very identity of the Trinitarian God, that, that manifests itself in the church. We ought to have the same kind of unity as the Father, Son, uh, and the Spirit. Uh, and so we're to be his people, his family, we're to be his body, which is a deeply integrated, um, a mutually necessary integration of people. And then we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. When Paul uses that imagery, we're to be the place where the power of God uh, and the magnificence of God radiates out to, to whatever city the temple has been set in. We're, we're representatives uh, of God. And so... The, the um, ideas that are joined together with that as the people of God, we are kingdom people. We're, um, uh, we're ruled by a king. Uh, we have been given territory to take. Uh, and we are to be a, a people governed uh, by God uh, expecting to, uh, to expand His kingdom. Uh, as the body of Christ... We're new creation people. So once again, this is a place and a zone where people ought to get a taste of what things are like in heaven. I said something in a sermon, I don't, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago. If you, if you don't think you'll be doing it in heaven, go ahead and stop doing it now. Remember when I said that? And that really ought to characterize the church. We're not doing things that the world does in here because we're new creation people. 
which includes whining and griping and complaining and criticizing one another and, 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 and being ugly to each other and ignoring one another's needs and putting ourselves before others, that, that sort of thing. All that's gone because we're new creation people. Well, how do you do that? Uh, you have to be transformed by the redeeming power of Christ or we'll just keep acting like old world people. So as the body of Christ, we are new creation. We're new creatures. Uh, and as the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, we're to experience what uh, in Greek is koinonia, uh, a great fellowship. The fellowship, may the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. Koinonia is a very important word uh, in the New Testament. Um, that we should have um, a deep... Uh, um, relationship with one another that's, that in, in which our spirits, my spirit and your spirit is, is all linked together by the Holy Spirit making us one uh, and then showing the world uh, what the work of God looks like. Alright, so then uh, so what are the that's, the, that's the nature of the church, then the attributes of the church so what are some of the markers of the New Testament church? Um I've got a little Latin, because I know y'all love Latin. Uh, the notai ecclesiae. These are the four marks of the church. In fact, I'm using these in my sermon series right now. The, the ancients said that here's what identifies a, a true church. One holy Catholic apostolic, or the four uh, uh, notai ecclesiae and these are rooted in what the scripture declares so first of all the church should be one a unity that reflects the unity uh, of the trinity uh, in John 17 21 Jesus is praying do anybody remember what he prays in John 17 21 Jesus is praying for us that we would be one just as I and the father are one so that what so that the world can know that the Father has sent me. Our unity is how the world finds out that the Father has sent the Son. We got to move unity up in our, <laughs> in the things we think are most important. All right? So, it's perfect yeah, yeah, which is, which is the unity of the Trinity. Perfect unity. Um, our unity reflects the Trinity and it reflects the redemptive power of, uh, uh, to the world. Ephesians 2 talks about two men who are hostile to one another, enmity and strife, and the cross of Christ puts to death the enmity between us, puts us together from two men into what? Into one man, and that miracle shows the world what God can do. All right, so one, holy. Uh, we're to be holy as God is holy. That's what's said in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, uh, so, uh, holiness ought to be on display in our lives because, because God's holy. Secondly, holiness ought to be on display in the church because the, because the work of Christ in His church is to sanctify us. Is that, and that uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is using the marriage to point to the relationship between Christ and His church. And he, he uh, loves her and He washes her and, and He beautifies her uh, in order to make her ready as his bride. And so that's the work uh, of Christ in the church is to sanctify us and make us holy. Uh, and then we're to be uh, a, a temple, living stones built up into a temple uh, that's characterized by holiness so that the world can know. Please remember that holy, the word holy, we tend to hear the word holy and we think, snooty and self-righteous and fastidious and majoring on the minors and holier than thou, right? But the main idea of holiness in the Bible is set apart for a special purpose. Set apart unto a special purpose. It's not holiness for the sake of holiness, so I can say I'm better than you. It's, it's being who we need to be in order to do what we've been created to do. And so we're made holy and distinct so that we can do this redemptive work that God has for us. And the main thing is so the world can tell the difference between us and them. Thirdly, Catholic, all right? So I got some news for you. You may think this is good or not, but you're supposed to be Catholics. So we're going to make that switch, all right? The word Catholic in its original meaning 
I didn't just refer to the Roman Catholic Church, but, uh, and it's hard to find a good English translation of the idea of Catholicity. And I think the best word is manifold. The idea is that <clears throat> the church should be a place where as individual congregations and as all believers everywhere, we're experiencing together everything that God wants to do in us. There's no lack there's no, you know, we came up against this problem and we just quit because couldn't figure out how to overcome it. The church is just constantly gifted and filled and empowered and energized to do everything that God wants to do uh, in us. It's not how little, but it's how much uh, does God want to do in us uh, together. So it has this idea of, of, of universality. Uh, Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords is written on his thigh. He is in charge of everything. And because he's in charge of everything and the world belongs to him, there's no place where the world, where the church can't go uh, and, and uh, work redemptively. And then it manifests God's uh, full provision. I wrote Ephesians 1.23 and now I cannot remember what Ephesians 1.23 says. You got it? Fire away. There we go. Just as full of God as Jesus was, Jesus' church is to be filled with the fullness of God. Not a bunch of little nice people kind of being nice and kind of muddling through, but a people in whom God's glory is on display. Uh, one holy Catholic and apostolic. Basically, this is founded in the, on, on, in the Word of God. Uh, uh, founded on the Word revealed to the prophets and the apostles. Somebody read Ephesians 2.20. Because you're almost there, Steve. Uh, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There we go. We're founded on the apostles and the prophets. Christ is our cornerstone. And then 2 Timothy 3.16, of course, all scriptures God breathed and is profitable for teaching, for, uh, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete uh, for, for every good work. Okay? Um, so we're founded on the word and then we are announcing the word. So founded on it and proclaiming it uh, is, is what it means to be apostolic. So with these attributes, then, we can add some additional marks. During the first, really, 15 centuries of the church, there wasn't a lot of discussion about um, the nature of the church. The church was kind of focused on other stuff, and there really was only one church, the Roman Catholic Church. And so those four those four marks sort of did, that did the trick. But with the Protestant Reformation, there was this sense that we need to, we need to add to the list uh, of marks of the church uh, in order to describe what, what, what really is a true church. So uh, the church uh, is where the right preaching of the word takes place. So it's not only that, um, that the, the word is present in and around uh, the church, but it's the center of what's going on. The, the, uh, the preaching of the word and its proclamation outside of the church is the main thing. It's the main thing. Uh, in, in most Protestant churches, in fact, the lower church you get, the more to the center the pulpit goes. Okay? So sometimes you'll notice that in, in lots of, of churches that are more liturgical, the pulpit's to the side, and what's in the center? I don't know what's in the center. The altar. the altar. Very good. So the Lord's Supper is the center, and the, and the pulpit's to the side. And that's a, it's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? But in the in uh, Reformed churches that are increasingly committed to the concept of sola scriptura, the pulpit tends to be in the middle. And, of course, in front of the pulpit is what? The Lord's Supper table, right? So we, we, we try not to diminish that. But the right preaching 
uh, of the word of God and the word about God. Not only uh, are we created by the word, uh, but we're also uh, to be uh, in the process of learning it all, of preaching the full counsel of God, of knowing uh, everything about it. The word creates the church. Romans 10, 17, I think I'll get this, is, uh, it's part of a um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right? It's the word of God that uh, is primary in in saving believers and creating the church. Right preaching of the Word of God. Secondly, right administration of the ordinances. So the kind of the big idea in the Reformation was the church is where the Word is rightly preached and where the, where the ordinance are rightly uh, 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 engaged in, rightly administrated. So uh, we'll look at the two ordinances uh, of the church. They are given by the example of Christ and by the command of Christ. So that's how you tell the, the, the ordinances of the church. So the two ordinances are, don't look, what are the two ordinances of the church? Come on. Baptism and Lord's Supper. Very good. This will be on the test. All right. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. All right. Um, baptism. Uh, and the Lord's Supper both given by the com example and the command of Jesus. Uh, was Jesus baptized? Yes. yes, he was. All right, the fulfillment of all righteousness, baptized in the Jordan. Uh, and then in the Great Commission, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so Jesus was baptized, tells us to, uh, to, to baptize. And then uh, in the church in Acts Repentance and baptism is always going together. The first sermon, Acts chapter 2, 28, the, 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 the men whose hearts were rended by the preaching of the gospel say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. All right? So, so baptism is right, uh, right there. So some things to know about, first of all, is the mode. Now here we go, Baptists. All right? Here's the part where we're better than everybody else, which is why you're here, right? So the mode, the word for baptize is baptizen, baptizen, all right? To bab, to immerse. That's what the word means, to put someone underwater and lift them back up. Now, all you sprinklers out there and that kind of thing, I'm sorry, but the word is dunk, all right? The word is dunk. Um, and it's dunk because what is it a picture of? Buried. And risen again, all right? That, by the way, is why we put people through the trouble of getting soaking wet in a sanctuary, do this very odd thing, right? And, and a lot of times folks, especially adults who are coming from another tradition, aren't just jumping up and down to get dunked because it's strange, all right? Yes, sir. All right, can we go back one step? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized in baptism. Is that not where the theory of some folks is that you have to be baptized? Right, yeah, yeah. And I'll get to that. It's called baptismal regeneration. Uh, Church of Christ teaches you have to, until you're baptized, you're not saved. And they go to those verses where Peter will say, repent and be baptized. And those, th those things have to go together. I'll get there. <clears throat> um, but it's a, because it's a picture of, of death, burial, and resurrection... That's why we teach that, that um, sprinkling doesn't con really contain that picture of death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we don't sprinkle. Um, and so uh, Romans 6 is a good man, strong baptism. You are buried with Christ. Uh, 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 die. You die with Christ, buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. A very a strong picture of, of, of the, the power and the meaning of baptism. So that's the mode. We just believe here in the Baptist church uh, that uh, you got to dunk them. Uh, and then who are the subjects? The subjects are, number one, free agents. This doesn't mean athletes who are wanting to get uh, uh, an extra million dollars. Uh, the, the technical meaning of that is people who are able to make a decision for themselves. And so uh, uh, these people need to be able to make their own decision about following Christ first and second. And the subjects of baptism are those who repent and believe. Who, who have themselves made the conscious decision to repent and believe and follow Christ, then they are, 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 are baptized. Again, we have the, we have the command of Christ uh, and we have the examples of Christ um, in this. And so, uh, 
What are some of the limits of baptism then? It does not save us. What we, what we teach is that baptism is a, is a sign, it's a picture, an outward expression of an inward reality. And so while baptism is important, it does not save. Um, and uh, so it does not save, and that's versus what's called baptismal regeneration. So if you want the technical term, you want to sound cool, or you're talking to your Church of Christ friends, and, and uh, boy, do Church of Christ people like to talk about how baptism saves you and you can say oh you mean baptismal regeneration and that might throw them off kilter for a second or something so uh, baptismal regeneration we don't uh, don't, don't believe the, the Bible teaches that it's um, and it's not for infants why is baptism not for infants because they can't make their own decision somebody else is making the decision for them and we'll when we get to what the church history teaches we'll, we'll get back to that but infants uh, can't be baptized because they can't make decisions for themselves. And uh, baptism is an expression of repentance and faith. <clears throat> All right, then the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, again, the, the example of Christ and the command of Christ. It's instituted by Jesus in Luke chapter 2. Um, this is my body, this is my blood. And then he also says in verse 19 of Luke 22, Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to keep on celebrating uh, this meal together. Um, as, a, uh, as, an, as an ordinance uh, and a, a, a by my command. So the mode is bread and wine. I got wine in quotes, right? Why do I have wine in quotes? Because I'm talking to Baptists, all right? And so, you know, ours is grape juice. I have, have a little bit of trouble with, with fermentation. I won't spend a ton of time on this. Um, in the Bible, it's wine, okay? And please, if you don't think this, don't get in a fight with me about this now, okay? We can fight about it later because I, because I, I know the other cases. I, when in doubt, I just let what the Bible says be what it says. And, and I'm, I'm always a little struggle to, to, to bend something around. Now, uh, I would agree that the kind of wine that was being drunk back in the day You'd have to drink six gallons of it to get very drunk by it, okay? And uh, only really wealthy people was drunkenness available to them because most people just didn't have the money uh, to, en to engage in that. But um, I don't think there's any good reason to believe that what was being consumed at the Last Supper was, uh, was wine, which means fermented grapes, okay? The reason why we don't use fermented wine at our, uh, in our uh, supper uh, is uh, there's a strong tradition in, in, in Baptists of being teetotalers. We kind of came up uh, during the time of, of um, really taking a stand against uh, the, the, the ravages of alcohol. Because I'll just go ahead and say, as a Baptist, um, um, I don't drink and, and alcohol can cause problems. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of our uh, tr tradition. But the other ditch is uh, that Baptists can get into is being is making the Bible say something that the Bible doesn't say, and then being very legalistic and judgy about those kind of things when the Bible doesn't. All right. So anyway, so we use grape juice, and then a fun story. Um, I had a group in uh, uh, with me in Israel. And we went to have the Lord's Supper at the Garden Tomb. Anybody ever been to the Garden Tomb in Israel? All right. Um, and it's real neat. So you have the Lord's Supper there. And they brought us the Episcopal elements. All right. And wow, you should have seen the surprise look on those Baptist faces when they had Episcopal Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was fun to watch. Anyway. Um, that's baptism, Lord's Supper. And so then the subjects who can take the Lord's Supper, those with an understanding of the significance uh, of, what it means, of what it means for Christ to be for me and in me and through me, or Christ for us, through us, and in us uh, for the world. Now, and here's what this means. I think it's a good idea. Uh, what do you do with your children? I think is one of the things that, that can come up when you have your kids with you uh, in, in church. Um, I think it's best that if they're not saved, that they shouldn't take the Lord's Supper, okay? And it's a good, it can be a great time to talk about, well, why you can't take the Lord's Supper yet. 
and I may get trouble for this, but I don't think you need to slap it out of their hands. You know, <laughs> they get, you know, nothing's bad's going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, you'll get my point on that. I think the, I think the point is we we um, it's a it's a it's like baptism. It's a symbol of that somebody's already made a decision for Christ and that sort of thing. But I've been around people uh, and Baptists who were just like, man, you you're like it's like um, blasphemy. Uh, for, for a little kid who hasn't been baptized yet to have the, the Lord's Supper and, and it's just awful. And I, again, I just wouldn't get that hyped up about it. Uh, and maybe I was, uh, I, what helped change my mind on some of that, uh, we were having the Lord's Supper when Jake was a baby and he, uh, Janet had Jake sitting in his lap, her lap. And the, um, the little elements go by and quick as, uh, or uh, and Janet reaches in and she takes the element out. And you know how you hold it? You know how everybody just kind of, kind of like, I don't know what to do with my hands. You kind of hold it. And quick as a flax, Jake goes, <laughs> down the hatch. You know, boom. He was probably three, something like two or three. Uh, and he just thought Jane was handing him something good. Uh, and again, as, as usual, uh, Jake was very disappointed uh, <laughs> once it went in because I don't know that it's a rule that Lord's Supper bread has to be not that great tasting, but boy, we are really, it really doesn't taste too good. Anyway, I digress. All right. Do what? No salt. Okay, could you use a little salt? I'll let them know. I don't think there's anything wrong with a little salt being on the, on the Lord's Supper bread. Now, yes? Is it just unsaved children that may not take the Lord's Supper or anybody that's unsaved? Again, to... Uh, the right thing for the, the, the heart and center of what I think the New Testament says is that the Lord's Supper is for people who are saved. Um, now another thing we get into is church discipline. There's also people who are under church discipline. It's called excommunication and they are not to participate in the Lord's Supper. But that's a, ooh, that's a, that's a whole different kettle of fish and we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, I know, for instance, at John MacArthur's church, before they have the last, the Lord's Supper, he reads everybody who can't take the Lord's Supper. Like, he, <laughs> if you're here and I read your name, you may not take the Lord's Supper. Whoa. So I don't see us doing that. Um, but but anyway, we'll, we'll get, to, get to that question of, of how, how it relates to church discipline. But also, uh, a, a long-running debate in, in Baptist life is whether it's called open and closed communion, whether or not members at First Baptist Church can take the Lord's Supper at Fish River. Uh, or, and, and we used to get in real big debates about such things, but I think now pretty much a universally Baptist practice, open communion, which is, if you're a believer, even cross-denominationally, cross uh, you can take the Lord's Supper together. And even uh, if you are a Christian who has a different view of baptism, we still take the Lord's Supper together. And that, that would be my position on that. I wouldn't say, oh, are you Episcopal? Any Episcopals in here? Y'all better not be taking the Lord's Supper. I, I, don't, that's, I don't think that, that uh, is what Jesus has in mind. All right. So, and then membership, another, another uh, aspect of of uh, what characterizes the, the, the church from the Old Testament, I mean, from the, from the scriptures. Uh, churches are composed of members. Once again, there wouldn't be any, any biblical distinction between a Christian and a church member. They have a one-to-one -one relationship with each other. So, first of all, again, there's no biblical notion of a Christian without a church. And you see that in this imagery. That is like an arm without a body. Uh, that is like a son uh, who uh, the, the family refuses to share the last name or any food you're, uh, or, you know, or any uh, care or concern at all. Uh, it would be like saying, uh, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm an American citizen, but I don't live in America. Uh, I'm not recognized. Uh, uh, I, uh, I don't know anything about America, and I don't share any of the values. It's, 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 it's meaningless uh, at, at that point. Um, so... Uh, that kind of community is what's being called for in the New Testament. So these members then have profound duties to one another. 
probably the fundamental duty that sums up all the others is we're to love one another. 1 Corinthians 13, which usually shows up at weddings. You need to remember that that's the love is patient, love is kind, doesn't keep a record of wrongs. You know, you know, you know which passage I'm talking about. And it's fine to read it at a, at a wedding. That's a good definition of love. But the passage is for the church. 1 Corinthians 13 is about the church and the way church members are to love each other. All right? And so the central idea, love one another, that's Jesus' charge to his disciples. We're to love one another. We're to take responsibility for one another. We're not in just some social organization that we kind of, you know, tolerate each other's existence for an hour a week, but we're to, we're to feel a responsibility to one another, responsibility for one another's children and, and, and lives and, and, and burdens and hardships. We ha we're to have the responsibility of a deep unity uh, together. We're to serve one another, sacrifice for one another. There should be mutual submission. That's what's talked about in the book of Ephesians. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and submit to leaders. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey your leaders um, th because they, they're given charge over your souls. And so uh, these are the duties that ought to be uh, on display uh, in the church. And then our polity, that just means the way we govern the church, the way we make decisions and, and work together. Um, this is the responsibility for maintenance of our life together. And what I affirm that the New Testament teaches is that the responsibility for the maintenance of our life together belongs to the congregation. We don't get instructions from some group elsewhere, but it's the responsibility of the congregation uh, uh, to organize and, and, and do the work of the church together. And that's from Acts chapter 6. When there's a problem and the leaders say, you know what would be a good solution to this problem? Uh, I think some deacons would be a good solution to this problem. And then the congregation chooses the deacons. All right? Um, so uh, in our polity, uh, what, what we think the New Testament, New Testament teaches is a congregational polity. The ultimate authority rests with the congregation. But at the same time, we're to have church leaders who are qualified and chosen by the congregation to give leadership. They're to be uh, above reproach in 1 Timothy and Titus. We have a description of the qualifications for leaders, elders, and deacons. And um, uh, they're to be above reproach. And above reproach means they're to have a reputation. They're to be known. Uh, they're... They're to have a consistency in their life for three things. They're to be above reproach in what they believe. They're to have sound doctrine. They're to know the gospel and uh, can uh, articulate uh, what it means to be saved. And uh, they, they um, uh, ought to be able to articulate uh, the, the, the fundamental doctrines of, of the Christian faith. So they ought to be able, above reproach in what they believe and their behavior and there's all kinds of descriptions of being sensible, not being quarrelsome and that sort of thing. And then their family life. A, a, a man can't lead in the church if he can't lead his family well. Uh, if he's leading his family well, that's an indicator of how well he'll do leading in the church. Um, uh, within these leaders, it breaks out into two deacons. Is the first group deacons. And the heart of deacon ministry is, is serving, it's three things. Number one is serving unmet needs. Uh, these are a group of people who, when there's a need of the moment um, that arises that no one else is really taken care of. And so very often unmet needs are experienced by people who are most likely to be ignored. So the deacons have a special attention, and in Acts chapter 6, it's to the widows. These little ladies that, you know... Uh, don't, don't have very much to give and they're older and, and that's really might be easy to ignore them. The deacons pay special attention to them. So meeting unmet needs. Uh, meeting unity needs. There's a unity problem. People in the church in Acts chapter 6 have gotten a little bit aggravated with each other. And so the deacons exist to bring people back in a unified relationship with one another. Uh, and then to meet leadership needs. The leaders in Acts chapter 6 say, we don't have time to stop what we're doing and ministering the word and praying. And so we're going to have some people come along to help us. Okay? Now I'll tell you, one of, one of the, of the um, uh, traditions that's grown up in churches and even in the Baptist church is deacons as a board of directors. Uh, and that really grew up uh, during a time period when Baptist churches were very rural, um, 
but still by that time in the, in the 17 and 1800s, all, ch all Baptist churches really expected to have a, a preacher that was trained and sort of uniquely not among the lay people, all right? So you needed to have a, a preacher uh, at every church. But if you were a tiny Baptist church in rural North Mississippi and you needed a preacher, how uh, often how would little churches, little rural churches work out having a preacher? They'd share them, all right, right? And so one preacher might have four congregations. And uh, often what that meant was that they just one a week, right? And so since the preacher or the pastor or the shepherd was gone most of the time, and, and couldn't be there even to know the congregation, it became increasingly the deacon's job to run the church. Okay? And, that, that, and then as a um, sort of a modern corporate board idea kind of came in, it's, all those things kind of melded together uh, uh, so that you had deacons functioning more like a board of directors uh, than maybe a complete New Testament vision. And, and uh, so the churches had to, and Baptist churches have had to, had to kind of work through um, that distribution of power, especially the relationship between pastor and deacons. I'm thankful at our church that we don't have a pastor deacon, you know, that sometimes you, you hear about, but that's, that's how that, that rose up. But, the, but really the idea is that deacons should be serving, and one of the groups the deacons should be serving are the pastors. Okay? Uh, and then, so then there's pastor. And you see three terms in, in the New Testament, pastor, elder, and bishop. And uh, for all intents and purposes, pastor and elder and bishop, they're all referring to the same role, all right? Pastor means shepherd, elder means somebody who's older and experienced and knows what they're doing, uh, and bishop means overseer, someone who's really looking. A shepherd is probably paying attention more to the flock where an overseer is, is looking for things that are coming against the flock. And so this elder person, when you, when you roll all of those things to get together, my job is really has a threefold aspect. Uh, is One is to be shepherding and giving shepherd care. One is to, to make sure that I know what I'm supposed to know uh, so that I can give good, sound, experienced leadership. Uh, and then um, that I, I'm not only looking to you and your needs, but I'm looking out. I'm, I'm looking up and looking over uh, to see if there are uh, any, any things that are coming from the outside to attack you or to attack the church or disrupt unity. Okay? And so uh, there are some questions within this. Uh, uh, um, what we believe in, uh, in our church and in Southern Baptist theology is that um, the pastor position is reserved for males. Okay? Uh, and in our church, we um, believe that that role is reserved for males for deacons as well. It's honestly a little harder to make a case for male-only deacons just because Phoebe was a deaconess in Romans and, and that sort of thing. But um, I'll just leave that where it is uh, uh, for now. But uh, it's, it's easier to make a case for a uh, pastor as male-only. Uh, Paul makes a, a case for uh, the ordering uh, in the household uh, and um, uh, leadership being reserved for, for men in the household uh, and that, that that ought to be mirrored in the church. And I think in a practical level for, for men to be spiritual leaders in their homes, they need a man to be the spiritual leader over them at the church. So that's a little bit of my thinking on that. And then uh, another aspect of, of a New Testament church is discipline. And the point of, of discipline is to restore straying members. And here's the main reason why most churches have abandoned church discipline. We've talked about it across the years here, but we really are still trying to figure out what it might mean to be a church that practices church discipline. Baptists used to love them some church discipline. About 100 years ago, we loved booting people out. I mean, and smacking people and, and and, extra, and we called it church discipline. But it was mainly, the point of it was just to kick people out of the church for misbehaving. But the point of discipline is what? The New Testament point of, of church discipline is what? Is to restore people who are, 
And, and to say, that guy is really, that gal is, that family is really hurting and having a problem, and we are going to go get them. Uh, and sometimes in having to, having to go help people, you got to, it's a little tough love. You've got to say, this is what you're doing is not, this is not God's will for your life. It's not God's will for your, your, your family and your children. And so we're, we're here to say, how can we help you um, get, get, get back uh, uh, in, in the will of the Lord? So it's to restore straying members. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, you bear one of those if you see a brother sinning, go to him and try to restore him, try to bring him back. Matthew chapter 18, um, uh, when, when, a, when a brother is sinning, you go to him and you take a few others and, uh, and then you take the whole church and, and as, a, as a, the, the last ditch thing, you say to him, hey, you are out of fellowship and uh, you're to be treated as a tax collector or a sinner. All right, we hear that we think, whoa, treat somebody as a tax collector and a sinner? That sounds kind of harsh, except how did Jesus treat tax collectors and sinners? He loved them. Now, he said things to him like, go and sin no more, repent, stop doing this. But Jesus loved tax collectors and sinners. He just needed to make sure that they knew they were tax collectors and sinners. He didn't ever hide the fact that they were headed in the wrong direction. But his attitude towards them is beckoning them, calling them uh, uh, into right relationship with himself. So, um, I, I have their... Uh, it's, the whole point of this is not to shoot the wounded. And I think sadly very often in churches, if anything is done to people who are struggling or, or blowing it, people who are just blowing it, uh, the tendency is to either ignore because don't, we don't know what to do. And so we see a brother that's straying or struggling, a brother or sister straying and struggling, and nobody does anything. And they just finally suffocate spiritually and they're gone. Or they're dealt with only with harshness uh, and judgment um, and not a, a spirit that's calling uh, for them to be restored. Okay, so just something for us to continue to think about what would it mean for us as a church to, to begin to biblically exercise church discipline. We've been contending with that uh, uh, for a while. Um, then mission, ought to mark the church. Here's what our mission is, is to worship God, edify members and evangelize the world. And, and it's not in that particular order of importance. All three are, are, are interlaced and important. Worshiping God and edifying members. Ephesians chapter 5, those verses there. Sing to one another with psalms, hymns, and, and, and spiritual songs. Building one another up. Encouraging one another. Uh, and then evangelizing the world. That, that GC there is a great commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to all nations. Baptize them, which will make churches. Uh, and, and see the word go forth uh, to all the world. And then finally, consummation. Um, one day we will be what we are. And I put that in quotes because that's kind of a strange sentence. But one of the ways to characterize Paul's ethical instruction to the church in his letters is be what you are. Be what you already are. That we're, this, this, uh, another way is already not yet is a way to think about how Paul thought of the church. Right now, Dennis Watson has, every, has everything that God makes available in Christ Jesus. It doesn't come in an installment plan. It doesn't come a little bit, little bit, little bit. It is all available right now. And Dennis is still in a sanctifying process where he's learning what it means to lay hold of and access the fullness of what God is doing. And it won't be until he's glorified that he'll come into the fullness of of who he is and what he's been given in Christ Jesus, and so it is for the rest of us. So, the New Testament also pictures the day when the bride and the bridegroom finally come into the fullness of that relationship. And that new creation picture, the new Jerusalem coming down uh, out of heaven, the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that kind of circles all the way back around to we're to be this place where the world to come, there's a whisper of the world to come now uh, through our lives and a picture of, of what it will be like one day. Steve, you got a thought? Yeah, I've heard that that's why God is so patient with us yeah. because He sees us now of what we will one day. That's right, that's right. And, it, and I think He wants us to, 
sort of see each other the same way so that we don't get weary and lose heart or we don't lower our expectations but we also know and and doesn't it help you to treat each other better when you remember we're all a work in progress and doesn't it also help you because please understand this please when I say that uh, there's no place for complaining and griping and, uh, and, and that kind of church that, in the church, that's, I'm, just, I'm just quoting the New Testament. Do everything without complaining or arguing. But, or, but Paul also talks about urging one another to be better than we are. And sometimes Paul had to pull somebody to the side and say, hey, uh, that ain't going to work. You know, that's not good. And we're going to need to change that. It doesn't mean we're all pretending like there are no things that could be made better. That's, that's not love. And frankly, that's not how it works at 205 South Drive. Uh, Janet loves me, but she needs me to keep picking my game up little by little. Okay, And when I'm not, she doesn't mind saying, Yo. <laughs> There's an area of improvement I would like for you to uh, pay attention to. Okay, that's, that's, that's love. And the, way, and the way the church does that is that we, we hold together simultaneously. Um, there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less. And um, forgetting what's behind, I press on to the upward call in Christ Jesus, with, with all my effort moving from where I am to where I'm supposed to be uh, as a believer. And that may be a, let me, let me draw things down. First of all, do you have, I've covered a lot of different ground. What questions might you have? Any burning ecclesiological questions? And she used to come up and take elderly people to the doctor and all that. But she said, if I can get through this, and I know I may not on this side of heaven, if I can get through this, there'll be nobody I can run into or come in contact with that will want for anything if I have anything to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. That's, that's the point. And that's really the point of the church is that rather than it being something that sort of operates a little bit on the margin of our life. It's this nice thing to have around. It's at the center of, of what God is up to in us. Uh, and, and I think that's a good way to think about it. The, 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 the great bulk of the work that God wants to do in you individually is going to happen in and through and with this body. I'm not saying that you won't, there, there aren't other things that God wants to do and teach you outside of the body, but the, but the clear teaching in the New Testament is the, the, the great bulk of that. God's engineered it and wired it up so that it happens in and through the church. And the more fully and completely you can, you can um, subject yourself to, to the body. My, my, uh, what did, what's the Declaration of Independence say? My life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. The whole... I'm in. And when, when we're all in together, it, it's pretty astounding uh, what, what can be accomplished. All right? Well, off the foundation of the Scripture, then, we can unfold what, what uh, these uh, attributes of the church have looked like across the years, and then I can sum all those things up and how they ought to look today so that you don't think, wow, you're going to try to cover all of church history and all of the uh, current events at one time next week, but I promise you, I think I can get it done. So, any other final questions about church stuff? Yes, sir. Can I just say something? Sure. So, when we were, when Jen and I were overseas, you know, the idea of missions and, and God, God's glory, glory going to all nations, like, it's so important, and we're always thinking about it, but when, I, I, had, I think I got two really big lessons while I was there. One of them was, the necessity and, and the importance of the local church. And it was, it really was this, if we here don't do church right, 
then we are not sending missionaries that can really take the gospel to all nations. Yeah. And so if we don't do if we don't do worship and fellowship right right here, then the glory of God will never mm -hmm. go to all nations. <coughs> yeah. Right. I cannot adequately communicate to you how much is at stake in, in our life together here. It's, it, I, I can't put it into words. A, a, a illustra sermon illustration I heard a, a long time ago was the, uh, the, God had, uh, the Holy Spirit had been sent upon the church in Acts and, and the ball, but now the ball is rolling and the angels are sitting up there with God and they're kind of watching this unfold. And Michael says to, to, the, to the Lord, um, so you've, you've got these knuckleheads and you've, uh, you've unleashed the spirit and there they go. And I mean, some, some great things are happening. But what's, what's the plan if this, if this blows up? And the father says, oh, I don't have another plan. This is the plan. Now, uh, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So there, there is this sense in which uh, the church universal and the church triumphant it, it, it can't ever be stopped but uh, we've seen what happens to local congregations when they're destroyed by disunity by theological infidelity by uh, lack of seriousness about holiness about uh, ignoring the mission about no passion for children or the next generation they close the doors what did what did uh, Sean said 6,000 churches a day close in the United States and Sean was going back over that statistic and he was like oh, I don't think I have that right it must be 6,000 a year he went back and looked that's the now there's lots that are coming maybe about be a day maybe a year anyway thousands of churches close their doors and I can drive you around um, Baldwin County and, and Mobile County just show you the places that it's gone out of business. Um, in the Netherlands, there is a, a glut of, of empty, unused churches, and they've run out of stuff to turn them into. They turn them into coffee shops and laundries and, and that kind of thing, and now they just sit empty and dilapidated. Um, I think 2030, something like 2030, there will be no Christians in the Netherlands. They just look at, this, at the decline in the statistics. So, so much is at stake. Do what? Yeah, yeah, and, and falling. So, so much is at stake. And then, to, to not end with a, with a dark picture, I was, thinking, I was getting ready uh, uh, for tonight. Um, I have no memory of not being in a Baptist church. My whole life. And I always want to be careful. I know I kind of give you a hard time a little bit as Baptist because I are one, you know, and so it's fun. You know, I'm, I'm just having a little fun. Let me tell you what. Everything good about me, everything that's worth anything about me is what the Lord Jesus has done through wonderful Baptist churches that he's allowed me to be a part of. They have formed me. It was the spiritual womb of my life. My earth, I... I do not remember not knowing about Jesus. I don't, I don't have a, don't have a pre-Jesus uh, uh, intellectual life. Um, my memory is populated. Sam Cochran was my second grade Sunday school teacher. Uh, now, I was, in, I was in second grade, so I'm a little kid, but my memory of Sam is that he was like 12 feet tall. He's probably five feet tall, but to, he was this great, he's a man, and a lot of times men are not the ones who teach second grade Sunday school. But Sam did, he was the uh, band director at the local high school. And Sam, when we came in, he would clap his hands, and I've been waiting for y'all, and we're going to learn about David and Goliath, and out comes the flannel board, and, and, and I learned what a Christian man was. I also learned about David and Goliath and Jesus and Easter and all this, but I also learned that's what a Christian man looks like. And that's what being excited about Jesus looks like. And that's what not being ashamed of the gospel looks like. And that's what commitment at church looks like. That's what men do. 
And so every good thing uh, is because of the faithfulness of, of godly people in the churches where God put me. You had a thought? Uh, yes, ma'am. My, my mom took me to church from the day I was born, I guess, because I don't remember anything else. But what do people that are sprinkled, I don't understand that religion. Do they think they are, so babies are sprinkled mm -hmm. in some religions. Do those people, as they grow up to adults, realize they've got to make a decision for themselves? Yeah, that's a, the, the, the question of folks who have been baptized as infants is, is not an uncommon one that I'll encounter when they, they come and they connect here and, and even want to join. Um, and so here's what, here's what I say to them. Here's what I say when I'm talking to someone like that is I am thankful for everything the Lord used to bring you to today. And because those people Families that gathered to christen their, their, their babies, they were people of goodwill. They're, they, it was a, it's a sign, it's in, in that tradition, it's a sign of, of, um, of a covenantal hope that this child, you know, would become a believer and, and that sort of thing. And so rather than saying, you're wrong and we're fixing to put it right, is to, as I say, I'm thankful for how God used your churches up to this point, the love of your parents and that sort of thing. But uh, here in our family of faith, our understanding as we look at the scriptures is that, that New Testament baptism uh, is pictured by being lower below the water and lifted back up. And it's for, it's for uh, it's, we call it believer's baptism. That means it's for, for people who are, who are believers. Um, and I find that almost all the time folks are um, open to, to that approach uh, rather than being, but what were you, 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 you know, what, what were y'all thinking? Um, I, and sometimes I think we can be unnecessarily harsh. But also we have to say what we, what we think the scriptures teach. And frankly, the people who come here to, to go to church are attracted here because we preach and teach the word of God. And so they're, they're already here because they love the Bible and they, they want to do what the Bible says and, and they know that that's, what, that just what we're, that's what we're trying to do as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And what we'll do next week is I'll tell you how we got to infant baptism because I know on, on the kind of the Baptist end of things we tend to look at that and think, wow, that's... How do you, how do you, how do you get there <laughs> uh, from, the, from the Bible? But it's actually an interesting story and I will tell you there's a reason why we're called Baptists, and it has to do with the decision not to do infant baptism anymore. It's a really fascinating story, so you'll want to come back next week to hear, uh, uh, to hear that story. Let me pray. I'll let you guys get going. Father, thank you for calling us together to be your church. Help us to really live it out. Uh, um, to not settle for anything less than your word uh, and, and what you called us to be. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.